Hey everyone, welcome. Uh, so I'm very happy uh, to introduce Todd Fernandez here. Todd Fernandez is a mechanical engineer with a background in thin film characterization and semiconductor manufacturing. A former engineer on Intel's 32 nanometer process, he now consults for a number of high-tech startups on product definition and the transition from development to man manufacturing. If he's not on an airplane, he can usually be found trying to reverse engineer his Subaru, which sounds dangerous. It's so, fun. It's, or fun. My, so. my car is typically pretty much taken apart. <laughs> so. do, you, do you drive it around like that? Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So, there you go. Hi guys, I'm Todd. I saw one person doing it already, but just for the sake of everyone else, uh, that is a QR code that is a link to the download of this. Um, I generally find for all the people with laptops, it's a good way to engage people with laptops because I know I'm really bad at conferences of actually following along. Uh, for those of you without QR code readers, it's the same link on the bottom. So um, what you're looking at here is the first ever solid state transistor. It's a Bell Labs 1947 to kind of give a reference point on where this all starts. Um, I changed the title on here. Forgive the glib title that was on the website. I just, I have an odd sense of humor and it helps in this industry because the things I do are really odd. Um, so this is a necessary disclaimer for me. It's probably the only talk here that has a disclaimer. Um, everything I say, because there's no open source semiconductor development, Everything I say is publicly available information. It came off of a website somewhere. Even if I know how it works, the picture came off a website, and I have a 45-page document that has every single thing linked and sourced. Um, so just so you're aware of that, so it's on the record. Um, so about me, I am a mechanical engineer. Hi, CS and CE people. Um, what's the makeup in here? Is there C CS, hands up? Uh, CE, hands up? EE, hands up? All right, a couple of you guys. So you guys will know what we're talking about. Um, I've worked in both R&D, um, actually at the university level, up through the process development level. I've also worked in manufacturing and production. Um, now I work with startups. I do something completely different. Um, so let's start with some statistics. I'm sure everybody knows semiconductors are really, really small. How small? This is a human hair, a scaled human hair. Um, this is a transistor, uh, Intel 404 transi 4004 transistor. Uh, this is 1971. It's about 10 microns. Uh, this is a 1990 transistor, 800 nanometers. 2000, you can see that, and let's see. Smaller than AIDS virus. You see the dot? That's 2010, that's three years ago. Um, they're now about half that size. It's a real dot, I promise, they're, and they're actually mathematically scaled. Yeah, it's a little white dot. I changed the color because it's a little easier to see than red, believe me. Um, so you guys might know how a basic transistor works. These are the basic parts of the transistor we're probably going to talk about today. Uh, substrate, that's the silicon wafer. It's a semiconductor material that you're building the device on. You have a source and a drain. These are areas that you do what's called dope. You are injecting impurities. Usually nowadays it's done what's called a, uh, a uh, I'm blanking. It, you basically ion, inject ions of another material in there to change the electrical properties um, so you can create differing behavior in that region. Then you have a gate insulator. That's basically a little thin insulator that allows the device to function, prevents it from shorting out. And you have the gate material. The gate material is what you use to switch on and off the transistor and switch on and off the connection between the source and the drain. Basic transistor function. You apply a differential voltage across it. Then you, if the gate is off, if there's no voltage applied to the gate, you have no transmission between the source and the drain, the green and the red region. If you begin to apply a voltage, you'll start to develop what's called a channel. Um, that is creating an area that allows uh, electrons and electron, what we call electron holes to pass back and forth. Um, as, you, as it turns on or and on, or you get more and more of a developed channel, you basically have a connected circuit. Cool? Thing to note, everyone thinks about transistors. Are transistors digital? The answer is no. Um, this is what it looks like in implementation. But the more interesting thing is, this is what it looks like in electrical behavior. Um, you're seeing different colored lines here. These are different gate voltage, I'm sorry, different uh, voltage differentials, and then you're looking on the x-axis, it's voltage applied to the gate, and the um, y-axis is current flowing through the transistor. So you can, what you can see here is you have a very clear off region, you have a very clear on region, you also have a very much transitory region. So it's not really a device that at the microscopic level we treat as digital. Um, if you're in manufacturing, you very much treat it as an analog device. It's very different from how you guys implement things uh, as computer engineers as CS, where it's very much digital. You don't really see this region here. Um, the other thing to note on here, this is off, on. This is what we call threshold voltage. It's where it begins to switch. 
And then this right here, everybody talks about heat and power usage in, in transistors and in computer chips. This is your leakage. That's what's happening. Um, even when the device is off, they've gotten so, so small, you really have to work to control what's called leakage. That's, car that's current flowing through the device when it's theoretically in the off state. It becomes a big, big challenge because so we're talking, you know, microamps and things like that. But microamps on a billion transistors become amps, right? So it's, it's very, very interesting. It's very different to think about it from my side, where it's an analog device, versus your guys' side, where it's much more digital. You're talking about it at the gate or at the, uh, the logic gate level. All right, how do we build these things? Because this is always the fun part, right? Um, this is fab. Fab is what you think of. It's the guys in the clean room suits that Intel has in their commercials. This is the Samsung Fab in Austin. Uh, this little front part here is the office building. That enormous part back there and this enormous part over here are the Fabs. They probably do tw what's called 20,000 wafer starts a month. Uh, wafer is one of these devices, except they're doing 12-inch ones. So they're two or three times the diameter. This can hold about four times the chips. Um, this is what it looks like if you kind of, on the top right there, if you took it apart. Up top, you have um, the plenum area. You basically have mechanical stuff. That blows every th uh, air continuously down through the clean room space. Clean room space is where they actually make the chips. It's where the technicians and these guys live. Um, this is the inside. And then below that, you have the clean subfab, which is where support equipment is. And then you have what we call the utility level. That's where all of the nasty chemicals that get used in this process end up. Um, this is what a fab looks like when it's on fire. Uh, I don't know if anybody saw the hot, this was in China fairly recently. Um, it's a big fire. It's not supposed to happen. I just like that picture. Um, so the wafers. We talk about wafers. You guys probably have an idea of what a wafer looks like. I have wafers. If you ask a question, you get a wafer afterwards. That's my little trick. Um, that is where wafers come from. That on the left is a silicon ingot. Um, those are made of, that's an accurate 99.9999, et cetera, percent pure silicon. Um, with very, very controlled, uh, again, doping or chemical control of impurities to create the exact electrical properties you want. They grow them like this. It's actually chemically a single crystal. That whole thing, which weighs a couple hundred pounds, is a single crystal of material. It's cool. Then they dice them up uh, with a saw or with a laser into individual wafers that are then polished to make a device on. So you don't obviously make wafers on the single ingot. Um, I'm not even going to try and pronounce the process that they use. It's something Russian. So you guys are probably used to seeing small wafers like this if you guys have held wafers before. You may also be used to seeing uh, presentations from people like TSMC or Intel that are much, much bigger wafers. Um, the size of wafer really reflects the economics of how you make these things, how you make them at scale. The size of the wafer doesn't affect the device you can build on it but it does affect the very much the end price. If I have a one inch wafer, which is what they're using in the 70s, I can maybe put one or two chips on it. It becomes very, very expensive to manufacture that because of the economies of scale. So they're constantly moving towards bigger and bigger wafers. I have with me the three inch wafers. So this is early 80s and then four inch wafers. So this one's a little bit patterned. Um, these are totally out of date. Um, these get used in research labs nowadays or in process development. Nowadays, just about everybody uses 12-inch wafers. 12-inch uh, wafer is about the size of a dinner plate. Uh, so think about that, and it's cool, right? There's, trillion, there's probably trillions of transistors in some of these chips because you have a computer chip, a Core i7 or something like that, that has a billion transistors on it, and then you have 100 to 200 of them on any individual chip. A large fab will make anywhere from 10 to 100 billion transistors a second, which is just a cool stat. So this is what a 12-inch wafer looks like on the right. The industry is talking about moving towards 18-inch wafers. So think about 18-inch diameter wafer. That's a really big wafer. Um, there's a lot of challenges as those wafers get bigger. Like I said, there's a huge economy of scale. They get much, much cheaper. Every time you double the size of the wafer, you pretty much cut by a factor of four the cost of producing an individual transistor. The problem is, in a lot of processes, these get very hot, or they're put under vacuum, or they're spun at 10 or 20,000 RPM. So you're now taking something that is um, less than a tenth of an inch thick, it's 18 inches in diameter, and you're spinning it at 10,000 RPM. That presents some challenges there, big challenges. Um, the one technology that I'm going to talk about in terms of how the steps are done it really is, is lithography here, because it's the core process. You guys might have heard of lithography or 
22 nanometer or 32 nanometer. Those process nodes that you hear about are usually driven by the lithography, what's called line size. Lithography is what you use to print the circuit pattern or the transistor pattern on the surface of the wafer. Um, lithography is often the limiting factor, uh, almost always, in fact, the limiting factor in making the transistor smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, the way it works is, I'm going to try this again with the laser pointer. Uh, in the top right, you see this. This is what's called a coder. Uh, the coder puts a photoreactive chemical on the surface of the wafer, spins it out to a very, very thin um, layer. You then run it through a scanner. The scanner has a light source, a very high power light source. It has a reticle or a mask, and it has a lens group. That actually prints the surface of the pattern onto the chemical photoresist. It's kind of like film in your camera, except it actually crystallizes individual polymer chains and either leaves them behind or doesn't leave them behind as it goes through the develop process. So it's like 3D photography, basically. You're actually leaving a pattern that you can then do steps to that exposed area individually. It allows you to define different areas of the chip that you develop or build up in different ways. So lithography, because it's so difficult, has seen a lot of um, really neat technological improvements. The first one of these is something called op optical proximity correction, which is like, to me, probably one of the coolest things that, that's ever happened. If I wanted to print this shape on a wafer, I would obviously have to create a mask. The mask has something like this shape. Um, at a 32 nanometer or 45 nanometer uh, semiconductor transistor device size, if I print this line on the mask and then shine a light through it in a lithography process, the end result is going to look like this. Um, and that's just due to the size of the waves of light that are in use. That's not very good. So they, they've developed uh, a mathematical algorithm, a set of mathematical algorithms called OPC. OPC means that I develop a pattern that you can see in red. The pattern in red is what I put on the mask. It results in a pattern like this. And that's because you're working with the coherence and uh, the intersection of basically physics and trying to get physics out of the way. Um, light individual photons will actually interfere constructively and destructively with one another. It allows you to control spacing in corners. It's just not working. In corners, in long segments, in end segments where things are closed off. So it gives you a huge improvement. Um, and when you're trying to build these devices, those changes, those differences in the area go back to that analog phenomenon I mentioned at kind of the very beginning. If I can make them print more and more of the shape I want, I can get closer and closer to the, sh the shape that I want at end of line, which means that I'm closer and closer to the device that I wanted to produce, to the electrical characteristics that I wanted to produce and manufacture. So I, th I think this is ma basically magic. This is cool. Um, the second one is uh, a thing called anti-reflective coatings. Um, if you think about how, how this works, I'm shining a light down on top of the wafer. It's hitting the surface of the wafer and, and bouncing back up. Um, when it bounces, you tend to get a phase shift because you're hitting the surface of material and the light changes. So they put a coating on the bottom that controls that. On the left, you can see what happens without the coating. Uh, you guys notice it looks slightly pattern-like. That's the wavelength of light printing on your resist. On the right, they put in a coating that basically cancels that effect out. It puts it completely out of phase, and you get a very much more coherent straight wall. That goes to a much better device function, much better computer chip function end of line. Again, magic, completely magic. Um, the next one, you probably Intel has been talking about this for a while, is what's called uh, immersion lithography. Um, normally, you think a camera, I have a lens, I shoot through air, it hits something, or it goes back to my film, right? There's an air gap. The problem with that air gap is at the surface of a lens, you have refraction, right, at where a glass or any material meets air or any other material. You have an index of refraction. With air and glass, it's one. That means at the very corners, it's very, very difficult to image. It means I have to make my lines either further apart or I have to make the size of image that I'm trying to print much, much smaller. It means I have to print what's called more fields. I can't print as many chips at the same time. Instead, they put a thin layer of water. Water goes between the wafer and it goes between the lens. And that gives us a different numerical uh, index of refraction. That index of refraction helps us out, makes us, allows us to print smaller things because the different lines of light, effectively, the different photons, group closer together. Um, Immersion lithography is kind of one of the most current techniques that is in use to extend what's called 193 nanometer lithography. The idea is 
every time you, you get smaller, you're going closer and closer and closer to the actual wavelength or the frequency of the light, right? Light has a wavelength. Right now, they use uh, what they call deep UV light, very, very narrow wavelengths, about 193 nanometers. The problem is we're trying to produce lines and devices and features that are in the range of 22 nanometers in size. So we're making things with light that are smaller than the wavelength of the light. That's why we have the reflective coatings, and that's why you do um, immersion lithography. It's really hitting end of life. Um, you're at this point trying to make 22 nanometer lines, which are, you know, close to a tenth the, si a tenth the size of the wavelength of light that you're using. That's, as you can imagine, fairly difficult. So now they're moving towards what they call EUV, extreme UV. Um, extreme UV is going to be the next step, and a lot of companies are talking about it and trying to develop it now. EUV is, as you would expect, extreme UV. It's beyond deep UV. It's much, much smaller wavelengths of light. That, that smaller wavelength of light allows us to produce smaller features because the light wanders around less. Makes sense. The problem is EUV light is very hard to reproduce. Um, you don't get hit by EUV light when you're outside. The sun produces EUV light. It is completely absorbed by the atmosphere. It's also very difficult to produce. Um, there's a company called ASML. This is one of ASML's tools. And I wish there, this still had the guy in it. There's another version of this picture that has the guy. This is about 40 feet long, about 20 feet tall, and about 20 feet wide. This is just the part that prints the pattern on the wafer. This is not the light source. With EUV, the light source is the biggest problem. You think it's a light bulb, how hard can it be? Well, to make EUV light, they use a system called, um, I don't even know what to call it, but it's basically laser excitation of molten tin. As it's, there's a phenomenon where if you hit microscopic droplets of molten tin with a very high power laser of a certain frequency, it emits several photons, and I do mean several photons, of EUV light. <laughs> Not a lot of EUV light. Um, the current record is somewhere around, I think, 80 watts from a piece of equipment that consumes 5 kilowatts. <laughs> this is not the best efficiency. Then you have other problems. Glass, glass mirrors, um, glass lenses, sorry, will absorb 99.8% of EUV light. Air will absorb over 99.8% of EUV light. The molten tin cloud that you have to generate to produce EUV light absorbs about 80% of the EUV light. <laughs> so what they've done is they've, they're, they're trying to figure this out. First, now you have to do lithography in a vacuum. Um, if you know anything about the, the physics and the chemistry of producing plastics, which is what the resist on the surface of the wafer is, that resist tends to outgas. So all of a sudden, you don't have a vacuum anymore. You also have contaminants in your, in your chamber. So they're working on solving that problem. They've also gone to mirrors. Um, they use a very special uh, type of mirror that basically has multiple layers that can do controlled refraction to try and extract as much energy and keep as much energy out of the EUV light as possible. I mentioned the glass lens has absorbed like 90 to 99 percent. The mirrors are much better. They only absorb 80 percent. So the goal to get these systems to manufacturing, in 2003, if, if you ask people, when is extreme UV lithography going to come into production? They would have told you 2009. When you asked them in 2009, they would have said 2015. If you notice, that was six years. And then six years later, it was six years. Uh, the goal is to get something like 250 watts out of a lithography system onto the surface of the wafer. That requires, at the moment, and there's a lot of companies working on this because it's a billion dollar problem, something like a five kilowatt light source. Because you can't really do more than a five kilowatt energy source, or you start to have other problems because the fab itself just can't support that energy usage. So this should be really interesting. Um, ASML has a prototype tool. This is the prototype tool. There's like two of them. Um, one of them is installed at a facility in upstate New York, and I believe Intel just bought one. And I believe, um, if you're familiar with Global Foundries, they just bought one. Um, you're not going to see it in production for a while, though. It's a very cool, very strange problem. Um, yeah. You had a question? Yeah. Because um, um, you have to create a resist. Um, that 
you, so, so in the end, you're, you're putting an energy source onto the surface of the wafer to react with the resist. The resist is the important element here. And creating a photoresist that reacts with the X-rays or gamma rays you want but doesn't react with the background ones is quite difficult. It's been proposed. It's also very dangerous, as you can probably imagine. So it's a good question, though. Um, all right, the other kind of major enabling technology at this point um, in major changes in semiconductor in the last 10 or 15 years is a thing called atomic layer deposition. Um, a guy in Russia actually developed this in like the 1960s, and then nobody heard about it for about 30 years. <laughs> atomic layer deposition is kind of like an epoxy. If you know what an epoxy is, it's a two-part glue. Um, normally with semiconductors, you lay down a thin film of some material that you want on the surface of your wafer, um, through either a PVD, which is physical vapor deposition, you bombard a target with like a plasma and you spray off metal or silicon atoms and, you, and they are attracted to the surface of the wafer, or chemical vapor deposition where you inject a liquid or a gas under vacuum at high temperature and that reacts with the surface of the wafer. ALD is a little different. Um, ALD takes two parts and you alternate those parts. You put a pulse, you basically cover the, wafer, the surface of the wafer in one material, then you use a vacuum pump to extract it. Then you do it with the other chemical. You do A, B, A, B, A, B, A, B. What that allows you to do is, because of the type of reaction, create single atomic layers, single molecular layers of the composition that you're depositing every time you do that process. That's really important, because you see the picture in the bottom left, conformality. If I'm trying to make a shape, if I'm trying to fill a hole in the surface of a wafer, it's very, very difficult with some of the other processes because they react very quickly, and I can pinch off those channels. I can pinch off those channels, create shorts, create open circuits. With ALD, and you can see that's an ALD layer on top, you deposit something that is exactly conformal to the surface of the wafer. That's what it looks like zoomed in. That uh, V-shaped space in the middle there, with a CBD or a PVD, the other processes, would be almost impossible to fill because those processes would tend to build up on the corners at the top, they do what's called close off or pinch off, and you get what's called a void. Voids are airspace. Voids mean the transistor doesn't work. But you can see these are the, and if you zoom in on the right there, the individual layers that you're producing with that process. It also allows you to do very, very fine grain control. Why do we want to do fine grain control? Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. But first, somebody asked about what goes wrong. This is what can go wrong. We're going to take a little break here. Let's see, is this going to... Other way, maybe? There we go. All right. Um, talked about a 12-inch wafer. Everybody uses 12-inch wafers nowadays. This, in front here, this little device is called a FOOP. A FOOP is a front-opening unified pod. A clean room at this scale is a, what's called class 1 or a class 10 clean room. That means one particle, one particle per cubic meter of air. That's it. It's on the order of 1,000 to 10,000 times cleaner than an operating room. The FOOPs are what's called subclass one. There are effectively, the goal is no particles that are not meant to be there per cubic meter of air. They each hold about 25 wafers. A wafer, um, if you buy it and start it in the factory, is probably twelve to $1,800. At the end of line, if it's something like memory or a high-level FPGA, nowadays that wafer can be worth $60,000. So there's 25 in there. Watch what happens. My favorite thing in the world. <laughs> so now that's what happens. Um, this is a fab. If you notice, it's about 5.30 in the morning. Um, <laughs> you just see feet at first. We're not going to come near this. We don't know what the hell happened. These are technicians, and pardon my language. Um, the technicians are thinking, I don't want to touch this. <laughs> I don't want to go anywhere near this. You can see a head here in a second. What you, what you may not notice is that they're wearing a little bit of a different color jumpsuit. Um, they're an equipment technician. The way fabs are broken up is there's process technicians. They're responsible for monitoring the process as it goes on, and there's equipment technicians. The equipment technician steps in and says, I'm taking this situation over. What am I going to do? I'm going to call the engineer. <laughs> <laughs> that engineer is going to have a really bad day. <laughs> That's not supposed to happen. And, all right. Just one more time for my sake. <laughs> Where is it? Let's do this. 25. Each are worth 60? Uh, depending on the product, up to, I would say, 60 grand per wafer. So that's. Someone want to do the math on that? Yeah, I think I'd be on what cause that failure is. 
No. I have no idea. The question was, what caused that failure? I don't know. It wasn't my tool. I have nothing to do with that. That was posted on YouTube, and I just snagged it because it's hysterical. The most likely scenario in that is, is the robot. Um, each of these tools, you don't handle the wafers. Back in the day, um, back in like the 1970s, the 1980s, you'd see people in the fabs carrying around what's a box full of wafers. They'd dip them in chemicals. They'd carry them around. That doesn't happen anymore. The devices are so small that human hairs won't destroy a couple transistors. They'll destroy a whole device. Um, so they r exist entirely within that sub-atmosphere of a clean room. So you're in a clean room, you work in a clean room, but the wafers exist within the FOOPs and within the tools. Those are all subclass one. You don't handle it. Part of it is because most of the time they're under vacuum um, for a lot of the processes or they're very, very hot, partially because you need to position them incredibly accurately. But the trade-off is sometimes things go wrong, right? OK. So we talked about kind of the basic structure of a transistor. And I'm doing OK on time here. Um, let's talk about the steps of what goes into a modern device. So you're thinking there's a gate, there's a source, there's a drain. How hard can this be? Um, what you're looking at here is a basic substrate, the, the dark blue. The things in black are called silicon tre or shallow trench isolation. Um, if you don't have those, the transistors get crosstalk because there's so much electrical noise for the scale of the device, they will jump across the low resistance silicon wafer and either turn on or turn off or mess with the, the adjacent devices. So instead, you put isolating chambers between them. Those are filled with a heavy duty insulator like silicon dioxide is a common material. You then deposit your gate insulator. Gate insulator, we'll talk, I'll show you in a minute, very, very, very thin, very, very high quality um, silicon dioxide or things like that, very high quality insulative material. It is the core function of the transistor. A lot of the changes beyond lithography have been scaling this down below the nanometer level. It becomes interesting. Um, then you deposit your gate. Your gate is a semi-insulative or non-insulative material that is what you put energy through to create an RF effect effectively to turn on and off the transistor. Okay? We deposit that. That's another lithography step. Then we dope the source and the drain. We use the fact that our gate material is only where the gate is, and we know where the, the shallow trench isolation is. They create a nice little window, and they allow us to do what's called self-aligned source and drain. Because of the fact that we have the gate insulator and the gate itself there, when we dope those areas, um, it automatically lines up. You don't have to individually line them up. They line themselves up because of where the openings in the surface are. Then you do what's called the spacer. The spacers exist to do a couple things. One, they direct the energy coming from the gate downwards and away from the adjacent transistors. They also provide a lot of structural support for the gate material. The gate materials are meant to be very, very electrically what you want, but they also tend to be structurally unsound. Um, the wafers themselves go through a lot of processes where they're brought above 1,000 degrees C for very short periods of time, cooled off very quickly, put under vacuum. They're not structurally stable. So you use the spacers to, again, create those windows that we talked about and to kind of structurally support the gate and help define the gate. Uh, then you do what's called the deep source and drain. Um, the source and drain that you're going to end up with, you don't want all of it to be the same thing. The law of diffusion applies, right? You want to create a very, very customized map of where those impurities are in the surface of the wafer. By putting more impurities away from the gate, you get um, less resistance. You can kind of hold the transistor at more a closer to ready state, if you will. But you don't want to put a huge amount of those impurities near the center part, what's called the channel, in the middle there underneath the gate, because it makes it more likely that the device itself will short out. Are you guys following this? Are we good? All right, cool. Um, the next thing is salicide. So at the end, the end result of this all is to connect this device, this individual transistor, to the outside world. So we can form circuits, we can form logic gates, we can form a processor. You, it's very difficult a lot of times, I see difficult a lot because it's difficult, um, to connect this stuff directly to the outside world. Things don't want to bond to silicon. So what you do is you deposit one of a couple materials, nickel, um, platinum, niobium, very, very specific materials that when you heat them up, you can form basically a bridge, a, what's called a salicide, which is a, 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 an area of metal where the silicon, uh, the silicon atoms have actually intruded, mixed, diffused into the metal areas. Metal tends to bond to metal, so if I can form this partially metallized layer, it's much, much easier to bond other things. So you form this really thin layer that's basically 
it's like prep for the rest of everything else. Then you heat it up. You heat it up for two reasons. One, you're creating a stronger version of those salicides, and you're also moving the dopants around. Every time you heat the wafer up, right, you have to think about it. The law of diffusion applies, and you guys have all learned the law of diffusion, I'm sure. And so the dopants, the impurities that you put in, will move around. So there's a thermal budget as you're designing this process, as you're designing this wafer. I can put the impurities where I want to start, but they're going to end up in a very, very different place in a very, very different concentration. So they'll deposit them, say, in the top corner away from the gate, and then they allow for the fact that all the subsequent processes will slightly move them closer and closer and closer, so the net result at the end of line is having all those impurities where you want, so your device, your transistor, behaves electrically like you would like it to. Okay? Then you deposit a dielectric. At this point, you are sealing off the, tra the transistor from the outside world, right? This is an insulative material. It's where you're going to start building the circuits, where you're going to start connecting the transistors to the outside world. Then you cut a hole in them. That allows us to connect the trench, what we call a trench, you're connecting to the gate, as well as the contacts which connect to the source and the drain. That allows us to actually test this transistor, use it as a transistor, rather than just having this nice transistor that sits there and isn't usable, right? So that's basically the front end, what we call the front end of the line. There's two parts, there's front end and back end. The back end is the, is the area of the line that basically does that last, those last two processes, dielectric and then fill the contacts over and over and over again to build up your circuit. Um, this is a device. This is a basic transistor. I, I keep calling them devices. We call them devices. The back end of the line turns all of those, say, 780 million to a billion devices into logic gates, into circuits, into power management, into things like that. They're actually a functional computer chip that you guys can interact with, right? So that's the back end. This is what we started with. That's our theoretical device at the bottom. That's the device we built at the top, and that's an incredible simplification of the device. That's probably, even in structure, six to seven years old. So what does this look like in practice? Well, it looks like this. I think this is really cool. You can see a lot of these features. You can see the trenches, right? You can see the trenches. They're labeled STI. You can see the salicides. Um, in this case, they're probably nickel salicide. You can see those dark gray areas that go up. Those are the contacts. Those are where you connect to the transistor, right? You can also see in the very middle, that little dark part in the middle, that's your gate. That's your gate material, right? So this is a high-level picture. You can see a couple transistors here. This is what it looks like when you zoom in on the gate, okay? This is a, I think, 2007 transistor. So the clock speed on this individual processor, this microprocessor, was 10 gigahertz. This one was very, very quick. Um, it, was very, uh, it was a very, very simplified device uh, for a very, very specific purpose. The individual transistor speed is very different, and you guys know this because you're computer people, from the clock speed, right? Clock speed is instructions per second, effectively. Transistor speed, in this case, is about 200 gigahertz. So 10 gigahertz becomes 200 gigahertz. Um, it's a more standard ratio is about 5 to 10 to 1. Uh, if you have a clock speed of 3 gigahertz, you might have a transistor speed of 15 to 30 gigahertz, but that's still 15 to 30 gigahertz. Uh, if you think about that from the speed of light, because we all know electricity flows at the speed of light, that limits you significantly because you can't move an electron very far in the time it takes to turn on and off. You're talking, you might be able to move it an inch or less than an inch. Um, I think it's 2 gigahertz translates to about 4 inches. So if you're going at 200 gigahertz, it's like 0.4 inches. So it can't go very far. The nice thing is the devices are very small. They don't have to go very far. But what the, the other interesting thing on this is you're looking at kind of the, the basic parts of the transistor again, the gate and the gate insulator. The first zoom-in picture there, and that is an actual SEM picture, is the gate interface with the source and the drain or the substrate. If you notice, you can, it's kind of hard to see, but it says 1.2 nanometers. That's a silicon dioxide, which you guys would know is glass, gate that's four atoms thick. Four. Um, you can't scale that very much more. The you can't make that thinner. The transistor length, or what we call the channel, is 182 monolayers, or molecular layers wide. So we're talking about a device where the operating portion of that transistor, what's switching on and off, what's changing when you apply current and voltage, is four atoms tall and 182 atomic layers wide. I think that's really cool. So let's scale out. This is what it looks like when you cross-section a whole chip. So you obviously can't put a package, you can't put a ball grid array on a 22 nanometer transistor. 
This down here is this down here. These are the transistors. Okay. The green arrow is the front end. That's the only part we went through when I talked about building a transistor. All the orange here is the back end. This might be seven or eight or nine metal layers. Those layers connect and build circuits. They also get bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where we can actually attach an electronics package to the outside world. We can talk to the outside world. So you can see the number of individual transistors here and the size of them. And then you can see the, the size of the pads we're connecting to up here. This was a 22 nanometer Intel device. This one over here is a 45 nanometer. This is a Samsung device. This is the Apple chip that was in, um, I think, the third generation iPhone. So you can see, again, metal one, what's called we call metal one or metal two. These are individual levels of connection, increasing levels of connection, increasing circuit size and instruction set size, up and up and up and up and up, until we can actually connect to something. Question. Where do you put the cooling? Um, you put the cooling wherever you can. Um, I don't mean to be glib. It, th there's a huge problem in what's called dark silicon. I could put more transistors together in a more efficient fashion, but you'll start, what you're starting to see is, S is cache and memory, because it's so much more low energy, moved around the chip in strategic ways, because otherwise you'll overheat parts. Um, the, devi the device side, the bottom side down here, is where you're going to connect most of the cooling. That's where the back of the package is going to be. That's where the thermal heat sinks are going to be. That's where you're actually extracting energy from. Um, the problem with that is, as the devices have gotten smaller and smaller, the metal lines get smaller and smaller, too. Smaller metal has more resistance, creates more heat. It used to be that the devices themselves, because of the way the device function, the transistors function, was very much the source of most of the heat. That's changing. Um, and the thing about the insulated materials you use to prevent short circuits and things like that, the dielectric materials, as we call them, those don't transmit heat all that well. So you're starting to see the heat budget is more and more kind of distributed throughout the stack of the chip. So they're looking at different ways to, to absorb that heat. But most of the heat still comes from down at the bottom. And most of the heat is extracted through the bottom of the, of the package right there. OK? OK. So the question, yep, question? So on that picture, the balls would be at the top. The balls would be at the top, yeah. Up, where did it go? Up here, right? That's where, well, that's where your package is going to be. It's not necessarily where the balls are going to be. It's almost always where they are. But there's a little more to it than just putting balls there directly. Because this, this is a much smaller device. The device itself, the silicon die itself, is usually about half the size or so of the package. Because you, there's so many different points. And there's solder lines that go to the individual balls. So you can spread it out. So you can actually build a PCB that's not 87 layers to actually connect it to the outside world. Um, all right, so everybody always asks me about Moore's Law. Can anybody quote Moore's Law? There's, there's a patterned wafer in it for anyone who can quote me Moore's Law. At the back? Close enough. Get the there. So it's about every 18 months to two years. He, it was originally two years, but they, he revised it. Gordon Moore revised this idea to 18 months the number of transistors in a given area tends to double. Um, there's a lot of extensions of that, and I, I have a slide if, you're, if you have an actual question about it. But we're hitting, theoretically, the end of that. right? You have to, at some point, kind of hit the end of that. I have my own thoughts on this. But what you see is they start scaling in very, very different ways. Um, you scale the device, right? or you can scale the way your cores, your individual processor cores work, or you can go to multi-core systems. All of these are ways to kind of work around the fact that we're at four atoms. We're at four atoms. We need to figure out a way to continue to scale the basic idea behind Moore's Law, which is how much computing power we have in a device, right? So looking at all of these different ways. The next slide is, this is, I completely stole this from a DARPA presentation. This is DARPA's thoughts on this. The end of Moore's Law inevitably becomes economic. It's not about transistor size. I can go in a lab with a transmission electron microscope and move atoms around, and I can make a small transistor. It's doing it economically. We talked about extreme UV. Those tool sets are going to run $50 million a piece. The economic return on them is not so good. We're also seeing the way people use computers kind of move away from things where making it smaller and smaller and smaller doesn't always provide us that same gain. So 
what's going to be interesting, though, is Intel still pretty much dominates this market, right? What you're starting to see is there's a lot of, in, in any individual application, there's still a lot of junk on an Intel processor design that you're not going to use. It's an it's a optimized for everyone for design. What DARPA thinks, and I totally agree with, is you're going to see more and more special designs start to come up, specific to system on chip that you need, um, going to the manufacturer. You're starting to see this more and more and more. And it's kind of a different take on the same idea of where do we end scaling, but it's equally important. So it's just taking that scaling that we can't do at a transistor level and making it different, right? So other things we're doing, though, to scale the device size are really, there is a lot of work going on in this field. Um, the modern design improvements really consist of three things. Can we make off offer? You, he asked about thermal budget. Can we drive the off state of the transistor to a more off state, less leakage state? That's a huge thermal penalty that we can get rid of. It's very difficult to do that and to make the device switch on and off faster because faster means we have to leave it on less, means we consume less energy. It's all the same idea. All of this goes back to energy consumption. And then the other one is make on sooner. Um, if you can make off offer, and if you can make it switch on and off faster, you can do what's called reduce the threshold voltage. That means it turns on at a lower voltage. If I have an equivalent amperage at a lower voltage, I have less power. So those are kind of the three big things they're trying to do. Um, the first one is Intel, Intel pioneered, and there's other companies who use it now, a thing called strain silicon. So those source and drain areas and the channel area, you take them out completely out of silicon, and you stuff something else in there. And you stuff something else in there in a way that modulates the mechanical stress in the wafer in that region. That changes your mobility. It changes your what's called carrier concentration. It changes how many locations for electrons you have. So if we don't like how silicon works, we take it out and we put something else in. Um, so what you're doing in, in pictures, here's our device again. You replace the channel with something you want rather than silicon and you replace the sources and drains with something else. Um, they're using a lot of germanium. is, is kind of one of the more common ones right now. Um, the next one is, and Intel has been talking on this, and a lot of other people do it too, is high K metal gate. What is high K metal gate? Um, you saw a picture of a transistor, four, na uh, four atom gate. Well, you can't scale that down any further. What you want, though, is you want something that acts like it's electrically thinner, but you can't physically make it thinner. So what you do is you go to a different material. Uh, 1.2 nanometer um, thick, which is that four atoms. The silicon dioxide gate, we replace it with something else, something that has a different dielectric constant. So we make a gate that acts like a 1.2 nanometer thick silicon dioxide gate, but we make it out of something else. All of a sudden, it's three nanometers thick. That's doubled the thickness of our gate. That effectively doubles the amount of times we can scale it before it completely falls apart, because we can't scale the silicon dioxide one any thinner. You can't really go thinner than about four atoms. At four atoms, your tolerance is it works. It's supposed to be four atoms. If it's three atoms, it might work. If it's five atoms, it might work. If it's two or six, it doesn't work. That's a tolerance that you, you in the end, have to build into a computer chip. You have to build billions of times a day. You have to have a tolerance for how thick or how thin it can be. So this is what it looks like in practice. You can see that that thickness of that gate insulator got much, much thicker. That's a big deal. Here's what it looks like in practice. We've also replaced, um, they used to use, it's called polysilicon, which is just a different structural form of silicon with metal. Metal's lower resistance. It's, so it, it uses up less energy. The problem is it's also very, very unstable. So we replaced both of these. You have that high K metal, uh, the high K uh, dielectric, which is, again, notice, much, much thicker than the one on that other device I showed. You also make the gate much more complicated. It used to be the gate was all one material. Now, you bec now it's a lot of materials. It's a stack of materials that you can custom engineer to use the power that you want, to act in the way that you want. And there's a lot of research because effectively the gate almost acts like an antenna. If you think about an antenna, if you think about RF, RF is very much omnidirectional. You don't want that. You can do a lot of work with a metal gate to do different layers of materials, different combinations of materials to create a unidirectional antenna to point more and more of that energy directly downwards into your device. That means you're using less energy to turn the device on and on. Again, you've saved a whole bunch of power. So how does that work? Well, you just replace what used to be this nice single gate thing that you would attach a salicide and attach a contact to, the part in the middle, with this thicker gate oxide or gate material, gate dielectric material and this really freaking complicated gate structure. It's, it, it's, it, the, this, 
The research I've seen says it does something like add 30% to the number of steps required to build the gate, which is, you're talking going from maybe 30 steps to maybe 60 steps, 100 steps, depending on the process you use. There's a significant investment, but the return is there to make the device perform at a lower power, to make it use less energy, and to make it switch on and off faster. Um, the other one is kind of how do we build the chip? Um, for a long, long time, we, we use that process I talked about at the very beginning. You built the gate, you built the dielectric layer, and then you left them alone, and they kind of became the structure of the chip later. Well, the problem with doing that is those metal gates, I talked about them being very, very unstable. They will fall apart if you heat them up too much. It's a problem. So what they do is they say, okay, well, how about we do what's called gate last? This is just changing the order in which we build the chip. You build your normal device, and then you say, okay, I don't want that gate material that I deposited anymore, so you take it out. Then we build the, the high K dielectric, then we put the gate in. That change allows you to keep the rest of that, pro of the rest of that process pretty much the same. It requires, again, additional steps, but you're just building it in a different order. You're building something that you're going to take out later for the purposes of making a device or a transistor that's much more stable, that's more likely to work. Right, which is, which is the big deal is getting these things to the end of the, f the factory and they still work. It's a non-trivial challenge. <laughs> um, and then you build the rest of it, right? Okay. The other one is depletion. We all, we, I kept talking about building a device on the substrate. One of the new methods is rather than building it directly on that silicon substrate, you first put down a layer of silicon dioxide. That gives you now, when you add in the, the shallow trench isolation on the sides, rather than having the device, the transistor, be isolated on two sides, you have it isolated on all three. It contains the energy better, same ideas, all of these are improvements to make it go faster and use less energy, right? So then you build the rest of it. It's just sitting on top of a piece of insulated material rather than sitting on top of the chip, the wafer itself, okay? And then the last one, which I, I'm sure you guys have heard about a lot, is FinFETs. Um, Everything we've talked about is the idea that you build a flat transistor and you build it directly upwards. FinFETs take that idea and kind of turn it on its head. Um, you basically grow a silicon fin and you wrap a gate around it. Now, why would we do this? Um, if you think about the gate structure and you think about where the transistor, that channel that we talked about is being turned on and off, there ha there's, there's distance there, right? If instead I can put the transistor region, the, gate, the uh, channel region, up in the air, I can wrap gate around all three sides of it. That means any part of the channel is a lot, lot closer to any part of the gate. You can turn it on and off faster. You can turn it on and off of less energy. And the, the less energy means something to the effect of like 35% less energy to 50% less energy, which is a massive, massive improvement. The problem is you have to build um, fin fats. You have to build a silicon fin that is shaped like this. It's about 40 nanometers between them. They're each about 12 nanometers wide, and they're probably 40 to 60 nanometers tall. And if you look at the top left, you can see the middle there, that's the fin. That's the fin itself. That's the silicon that we've grown. And you can see all those individual atoms lined up like that in that perfect crystalline structure. You can then see the gate material wrapped around the side of it. If you think about that gate material is now a lot, lot closer to each individual atom of that silicon fin than it was when we had what we call the planar or flat device. Cool? All right. So where does this all go? This is, I got one more slide. Um, in 2011, Intel began selling 20, uh, 22 nanometer fin FET transistors, those last things we talked about. In 2014, they're all supposed to start selling 14 nanometer transistors. 2016, 11 nanometers, that's really small. Uh, 2018 or 2019 is seven nanometer devices. That's, and when, it, when we talk about device size, 22 nanometers, 14 nanometers, it's how big the smallest feature on the chip is. So at seven nanometers, you really encounter some problems. At four nanometers, everything kind of goes out the window um, because you're really getting to the point where it's, the concern isn't this layer acts in a certain way, this layer that I put on top of a chip. It's this individual set of atoms, this atom over here, this atom over here, is causing me problems or not causing me problems. Um, I update this slide every time I do this talk or a similar talk. Uh, the first time I did it, which was two years ago, a year and a half ago, the current record that I saw was they, somebody made a 38-atom transistor. Then it was somebody made a 7-atom transistor. 
um, there was just some research produced that said, here's our one atom transistor. Um, it's not really a one atom transistor, but it's one atom acting as a transistor. It's not, again, it's all about, though, in the end, what can you make manufacturable? What can you build that you can put into your MacBook or your Surface in the end? That's a great research project in a lab. And the idea becomes, how do you get it out of the lab, and how do you get it into an actual device? All right. So to finish it up, here are the guys from Bell Labs that built that first transistor. Again, QR code if you want the link. And I'm happy to take questions. What element was the one-atom transistor? Uh, silicon germanium. Oh, it was um, what material was the single atom transistor? And it was a, I believe it was a germanium atom. I want to say it was germanium. Uh, question in the back. Uh, now that they built a one atom transistor, are you going to have to update that slide again? <laughs> I'll probably update it and say, here's the, here's the smallest transistor that somebody put into practice. Um, because a one atom transistor, it's, it's, like, it's like a party trick. For a lot. It's like, it's like a, a bar bet, right? Great, we built a one atom transistor, but if you go look at the device they actually built, the, the support equipment that they built on the chip to make a one atom transistor work was bigger than like a 32 nanometer transistor is all by itself. So it's kind of pointless. You had a question? Can you say something about probabilistic computing? Probabilistic computing. Are you talking quantum or are you uh, so? Um, so th there's a couple things to note on that. Um, he asked about probabilistic computing. These devices, when we're talking about the devices that exist now, 22 nanometers and things like that, they're never really on and off. It, it, it is a very close to the idea of probabilistic computing already because you're kind of guessing. Um, you, but you're, you're guessing with a lot of knowledge about what on, off, what on looks like, what off looks like. Um, is that what you're, does that answer your question? No? No. <laughs> uh, can you clarify for me a little bit what you're kind of asking? Okay. Maybe with the mic. What I heard is that uh, the transistors that are made today are like um, designed to behave in a deterministic manner, and um, if uh, if we are if we are open to tolerating errors, then uh, it's said that uh, one could scale in a better way. Um, I don't know how much to comment on that. It, it, the problem with doing something like that is. The entire computing architecture is designed and built around deterministic processors. There, there is a company called D-Wave. Anybody heard of D-Wave? All right. They're making quantum chips, and they're making quantum computing. And it's still an open question of whether they've actually done it or not. But what they build is basically you feed the problem in, and then you wait, and then you read the problem out. And they do that by allowing it to settle to effectively the lowest quantum energy state. It is a mass simplification of what they're doing. Um, even then, though, errors in those chips, if, the, if they're not really deterministic, <coughs> affect your problem output. I don't really know if you can ever get to a point where we don't care what the result of the transistor is because we have to care what the result of the transistor is. There are things that in, in chips now, and the reason there's so many transistors is it's what I would call quasi-probabilistic, because one transistor isn't doing an instruction. One transistor isn't doing an operation. There's error checking at the chip level that kind of tolerates that kind of behavior because, again, the devices themselves at the very bottom level of that chip are effectively analog, that we treat them in a, in a digital way. And so those little analog variations, even my, say, 10 square centimeter die, there's variation within that. That means the transistors at one corner and at the other corner are going to operate differently. So that's why I say we're kind of there, but we're kind of not. Okay. Is that, that better? Yeah. OK, cool. All right. All right, questions? Let's start from the front. You? Slide 21. You gave me a slide number. I like that. <laughs> 21. OK, so this, uh, the, the one on the left, you're asking what site am I looking at? Yeah, so uh, oh. when, when Intel you shows off their latest okay. wafer. I'm sorry, I thought you meant manufacturing. So you, mean you mean website, I'm guessing. 
No, like uh, when Intel has a keynote at IDF or something, uh -huh. uh, and they show up, hey, this is our latest wafer of a 12-inch uh, Haswell wafer, for example. Yep. Um, which side of, are you looking at the top side or bottom side when, you know, the, the oh, side. side shot? Yeah. Um, you're looking at the top. So the, the, when they show it, you're seeing this. You're seeing the top of the device. This is the basic silicon wafer down here at the very bottom, and you build upwards from there. There are people that don't build upwards for various reasons, but almost everyone builds upwards. So layer upon layer upon layer upon layer upon layer, when they show you that wafer, you're seeing the top. So those little devices, those little things you're seeing, mm -hmm. and you also got to understand, that's not a fully processed wafer mm -hmm. that you're seeing. You're seeing one that's gone through just the basic manufacturing process. It's not to the end of line. It's not to the point where it's going to be diced and packaged yet. But you're seeing the top. You're seeing this very this area. So up like the uh, die shots that you see at Chipworks and stuff like that, you're seeing the top of the device. Yes. OK. If you're asking about, um, so he mentioned Chipworks. I have a, if you want to go learn more, slide. Um, oh, that didn't come out because I changed colors. Things to read, Chipworks. Chipworks is a company, I think they're in Ontario, Canada. What they do, what their job is, is they take these things apart. They dice them up. If you want to spend 10 grand with Chipworks, you can actually buy a layer by layer breakdown of what these chips look like. Um, the other one is there's a site called SMT Book. There's an instructor's guide, which is for, it's basically an instructor's guide for teaching a, a semester long course that kind of covers this same material. That's really good. Um, the Intel downloads, their PR downloads are fairly good. And if you want a site that explains it, Ars Technica is really good. All right, there are more questions up there. Either, either one of you guys. Uh, All right. Um, can you, you guys can sort of see this, right? What's the shape? of a die that you get off of a device. It's square. It's square, rectangular, something like that. That's a function of the processing equipment. The wafers themselves are circular. So at the very least, you're going to lose pretty much anything that you don't get a complete chip on, which happens. All the edge die, um, you will, good fabs will always see more than 90% unless they're at the very, very beginnings of a process. Great fabs will see 95 to 98 to 99%. And it varies wafer to wafer, even within the same box of wafers. You might see a very rare instance where you get all of the theoretically yieldable chips, what we call yielding. They work at the end of manufacturing, actually work. It's fairly rare, though. And within that, though, you guys, so everybody here is familiar with you know, buying different products from somebody like Intel. You can buy the, this gigahertz or that gigahertz. They sub bin. So it may not work perfectly, but it can still work. So it just might be sold at a lesser level. So what they do is they test, and they sort, and they what's called bin. They put them in different boxes, and they sell them as different products because of how well they work. 